I'm on it.
Okay, okay. So here's the time when, uh, hope y'all had a good work session. Here's the time when if you want, you can ask questions, please. And thank you. And as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, you can use the raise your hand function um, that is below on your Zoom. And then we'll start a queue and we'll ask you to unmute. Sorry, new work development. I forgot to oh. ask you how to explain that. Sorry about it, that. It is, it is all good. All good. Any questions from anyone? <laughs> yes, Caitlin, please unmute yourself. Hi guys. Hey, Caitlin, um, my how are question. You? I'm quite well, how are you? Well today, thank you. My question is, um, it's more I guess of a prompt. Would you talk a little bit about um, what the great directors that have directed your work have brought to the story? Oh yeah, um, let's see. Uh, let's see, I can do them, a uh, couple of them right off the top of my head. So Steve H. Broadnax III is a great director. And he bring, I mean, these are, you know, including, but not limited to, you know what I mean? Um, so he's brought, he, he makes a great room, makes everybody feel welcome and included. Um, there's certain rituals that all directors usually have to sort of, you know, create the sort of um, community. Um, and uh, a lot of joy, a lot of laughter, even though we might be doing stuff that's, that's, you know, heavy lifting sometimes, um, and a lot of uh, specificity. You know, you know, he he really he does he doesn't. I would say paint with a broad brush. Ha! Huh, this is a funny scene. You know, like that. No, it's it's beat by beat by beat, and that's really really great. Um, or Kenny Leon, for example, same thing. You know, very different project, same similar skills. You know. Um, uh makes a great room great to be around uh makes people feel welcome very very specific uh challenges the actors doesn't just let them get away with their easiest thing sometimes a lot of actors um have spent a good part of their career doing something and when they get rewarded for it they can they repeat it so kenny will challenge them and say, yeah, yeah, you're going to that place, but we want something different this time. We want something that's more specific to the part instead of what your your go to sort of thing. Um, there's there's that. Uh, let's see again. A little funny. We have a good time. Um, people like um, Liz Diamond, the same thing, or Liliana. I can go on and on. I've worked with so many directors, but those are the general things that that. Um, are you uh, preparing to? Uh, to work on a play? Actually, I'm preparing to sh direct a short film. Really? I know the writer, she's um, she's wonderful. And her mindset has been just, you know, do your thing, it's all you now. But it's like, how can it be all me when it came from your mind? So I just oh. wanna like find ways to- yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, okay, film, so film directors, what works really well um, is, and I think your instinct, Caitlin, is really brilliant. How can it be all me when it came from your mind? Yay. That's uh, that's called respect. You know what I mean? Which is very, very helpful always, but especially when you're collaborating with someone. Um, the times where it, it doesn't go as well is when the director forgets that. The times when it doesn't go as well is when the director forgets that narrative is a skill. Created, the creation of narrative is a skill. Um, and a, a pretty scene or an interesting shot or whatever, um, although that's also more of the DP, but an interesting shot um, is 
not as important necessarily as the story. What is the story? What are we looking at? Why are we looking at that? Not, wow, mm -hmm. we want to see birds fly across the sky. Great. And how does it help us tell the story? Um, and writers who are really good at narrative, creating narrative, are really good at answering those questions. And mm -hmm. so I would suggest to collaborate with her, him, them as much as you can, as much as they're available to. Um, you're the director, but yeah, it did come from them. You're going to have Thank fun. You. It's going to be amazing. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And yes, I agree. I think you're going to be amazing. <laughs> I love that you asked that question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. Are there other questions? Did anybody have a Tony pool last night? Anybody win big? Wow. Uh, 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 no. Uh, uh. Grace, thank you. You can unmute. Thank you. Oh. oh, Grace, do you still have a question? Oh, sorry, I do. I was just getting confused because I clicked to unmute and then. Sorry. Oh, no problem. No problem. <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, hi, hope you're doing well, Susan Laurie. <laughs> hey, um, my question is about um, how to sort of balance or tame ego when it comes to your creative practice. And I feel like this is probably a question that comes up a lot. But, um, you know, just how to really manage, you know, the like, you know, the ego wants, you know, perfection. And everything that you do feels like it's not good enough and it never meets your vision. And then you push through it and you you put out your art, you put out your first draft so bad and you never want to look at it again. So how do you really balance like ego when it comes to the evolution of a project, the evolution of a creative practice? What are some tips to sort of keep that in check? And is it necessary sometimes to have a little bit of ego and, you know, a little bit of um, sort of like self-reflection? Yeah. <laughs> What a great question. I'm laughing because it's such a great question. Is it is it good to have a little bit of ego or a little bit of self-reflection? So I um yeah, ego is different things to different people. Um, I think um every and everybody's ego doesn't operate in the same way. So some people's ego might be the thing, the very thing that makes them feel like they have the right to say something, they have the right to make something. And in that case that I say, yay, you know, you, you definitely need your ego. I think the thing that gets in the way is like fear, which isn't necessarily ego. Ego is like, you know, hey, I'm worth talking to. I'm worth being listened to, you know. Um, the first one wasn't standard English, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, so I would say, which is why we do this show, that work is the best antidote for lots of things. So if you can just focus on the work, those questions are really good. How do I, how do I keep going? How do I bypass my fear? Or how, how do I work with the fact that I'm afraid? You know, the fact that I want it to be so good that I don't do anything at all. Mm -hmm. Like you can have a little things to say to yourself, like, um, I just want to write one sentence today. You know, I, 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 we used to say a lot, we still do lower the bar, you know? So you say, I want to get my, let's say you're writing a novel. I want to get my novel done by tomorrow, you know, but it's 500 pages and that might not work. Um, but you could say, well, I want to get a half a page done by tomorrow. You're lowering the bar. You know what I mean? So you sort of bite off smaller chunks. The ego might, uh, move you to fear might move you to perfectionism might move you to um lack of patience with yourself you know so you don't want to rewrite because uh it's perfect right now or you can't deal with the fact that it's not great you know i say the daily showing up in your process is the best thing to help you manage your ego as you call it you know and right. how do you, as a follow-up, how do you deal with like 
shame and sort of like disappointment in like yourself not even like the reaction of like other people reading your work but just feeling like you let yourself down somehow even when you do like finish how do you deal with like evolving from that yeah uh, it's tr it's tricky i i um I'm, I'm one of those people who's like always yay you know I, be a be your own best cheerleader you know i mean I mean, it, you know, have some cheers for yourself, you know, be enthusiastic about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think of it. Think of it. I mean, do, do you have, uh, do you have a, a, a pet or a child? No pets, no children, Fr a friend? Yeah, you I have, have friends. You have, yeah. fr you have friends. Okay. So you have a friend, right? Say they came to you and were like, wow, you know, I just like, I just like went jogging this morning, right? And you were like, what? You didn't run a marathon, mm. right? Does that feel hurtful? How does that feel? How, how do you think that would feel to them? Not good. Right. Not good. Okay. So that's like your response. So they say they did something, right? And you kind of like discounted it and that felt not good. So you wouldn't do that to a friend right? So when you talk to yourself, when you get in your self-talk about your accomplishments, like, hey, I wrote today, right? This is you. This is Grace. Hey, Grace, I wrote today. And the other Grace says, yay, good. You see, you're allowed to encourage yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know how else to say it. Um, there are times when you should be mindful and critical and you should you should be in rewrite mode where you're you're trying to find the right word and you're really but that's not a shame thing. Mm. That's a a refinement thing. There's a time when you're running the marathon, you've done the training, you want to eat right the night before. You know, you want to arrive at the starting point at the appropriate time. You know what I mean? But when you're just going out for a jog or a run every day. There's a there's a big place for just praise. You're allowed to, I want to say love yourself. That sounds really woo-woo. We're not on the West Coast, but you're allowed to love yourself. Oh, I said it. No, I think it, it works. And it also sounds like sort of like radical gratitude as well to be lucky that I have even arrived at that place and that I have Give, my past self has given me the means to get there and like being grateful for that and having gratitude for all those versions of the writing process there you go see you can say that to yourself that's grace giving grace a pat on the back and it's it's not you know it's just like yay good job you go girl you'd say it to a friend you'd mm -hmm. say it to um the clerk at your local deli right you say have a nice day to 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 the, the the you'd say it to the bus driver or to the person on the subway hey you take my seat have a good day you 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 give that to strangers you know you're allowed to give it to yourself mm -hmm. um and and we need to give more of that to ourselves okay so that's that's the best antidote that's the way you combat or you, or you work, let's say work with, we're not going to combat it. We're going to embrace it and transform it. Those things like shame or fear or self-loathing or the you're not good enough loop that might run in your head, you know, or why isn't it perfect the first time around or all those things that get in the way of getting the work done, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. And and the wonderful thing, just keep visiting here and because you know a lot of people are helped by those kinds of questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Grace. Hi, Emma. You can unmute yourself now. Hey Emma. Hey. Hey Emma. Um, how are you? I'm well. How are you doing today? Really good. Um, I have kind of a technical question on the difference in process for approaching a shorter work versus a longer one, because it feels like obviously a different structure, like in short story versus like a novel. 
So how would you differentiate your approach between those or is there a difference? Yeah. 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 That's a great question. I, I think it's like, um, I mean, if it's like a short story versus a, a novel and I've written both, I've written really short things and really long things. Um, it's, it's the amount of, you'd say, you know, pipe you have to lay the, the, the amount of, or, or the amount of world you have to create. Right. You know, so in a novel, or in a long you know, play or whatever you have to you have to really create something that's going to be very meticulous over a long period of time like 300 pages 400 pages right um and in a shorter thing the work is just as specific but it's not as much right so i i in my experience it takes sometimes more effort you know, to write those 400 pages. I mean, I, uh, does that make sense? Does that sound like it? Or is, is it, is it all the same to you? What are you feeling? Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. Um, no problem, no problem. Uh, um, I mean, for me, I just feel like I struggle with longer because it's more work there, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Just struggle to keep something that has a clear like narrative, but doesn't have pieces that feel like filler or like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just trying to make more pages. <laughs> right, right, right. I hear you. Sam Shepard had this great essay uh, a while, he's passed away now, but a, a while ago wrote this essay called Time. And it was in the era where, you know, plays were supposed to be, you know, this long, you know? And he just said, you know, play should be as long as it is. You know what I'm saying? So don't get so hung up on on the length of a thing or, or a novel. I mean, they're brilliant novels that are relatively short. Um, let's just see, what can I think of one? Uh, the Bridge of San Luis Rey, uh, The Great Gatsby, two off the top of my head, for example, those are relatively short and they're brilliant. They're as long as they should be. Maybe your form is a shorter form, you know? Um, you know, and, and, and conversely, people say that, you know, songs to get, well, they used to anyway, to get like airplay should only be this long, or they do now, right? A song can only be like 12 seconds to fit on TikTok or something, or I don't know what the... <laughs> You know, but it can only be this long. If it's any longer, then no one will want to listen to it, you know. Um, or it used to be 100 years ago, they used to say the three minutes for radio play, right? And then if it were longer, no one's going to listen to it. And people, great artists just wrote, they still do. They write the thing and they take the length that they feel it needs. So if you're writing a lot of short novels, right, maybe that's what you do. You write short novels. That's cool, you know. If you find yourself writing, you know, a lot of songs and they're 17 minutes long each, that's fine. You know, you're allowed to, um, you're allowed to love yourself. You're allowed to be free. Okay. You know? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Emma. Uh, so SLP, we have a question that came in from the live chat through HowlRound. So I'm going to, I'm going to read it. Um, so this is from the last black man in Nebraska. And their question is, how does one approach writing a dramatic arc for a group or institution rather than a character? Uh, I'm working on a play that tracks the arc of an institution rather than a specific person character. And I'm struggling to outline the non-personal arc. Hmm. Hmm. What a great question. Last black man in, in did you say Nebraska? No. Yeah. 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 The, the name is the last black man in Nebraska. I love that. Love that name. Um, I mean, I, you know, I mean, personally, this is like me personally, personally, I love characters. I just love characters. And I love, we talked a couple of weeks ago about, you know, desire. So I'm always like, what's your character and what do they want? You know? So that's what I go for. So even if it's an institution, like, um, I don't know, an institution, say um, um, 
a college, for example, that's the first thing that comes to my mind, write an institution, um, or, or let's just say the, uh, you're writing a play about, mm, I don't know, the IRS. Is that an institution? I'm, I'm just making shit up, like things with buildings and shit. I would say, who in there is drawing me? I would find a who or a, a few who's in there who are, are drawing me in and get in touch with their story and have their story be my way in. That's what I would do. So because in, unless your buildings, you know, the institution has desires. Um, um, but I, I would find a couple of people in who who are a part of the institution who can be my way in whose desires will uh show me what the institution is all about for example does that make sense um i would try that but I, then i'm a character i'm a i'm a lover of i'm a i'm a lover of paypal so that's kind of where i go you know what i mean um and I love I love the people who make the institutions. I love the characters because they create the plot, and character and plot aren't separate. They are they work like this, and they create each other. Um, so I I would say, is there someone in that institution who is you know looking at you saying, "Come on, last black man in Nebraska, I'm over here," like that, and then ask them, "What do they want? What do you want? What are you going for?" What do you want more than anything? And have them lead you through a, an understanding of the institution. Like, like, I'm sorry, I have one more thing. Like the institution of marriage, right? That's an institution. Okay, the institution of marriage. I think it would be cool, the institution of marriage, to explore the institution of marriage through looking at people who are married or not. Through people, yeah. Like they say about God, God works through people. And so does art. <laughs> it's Monday. Does that make sense? Last black man. Thank you, SLP. And yes, feel free to share more in the chat if there's further questions or thoughts. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, person, brother. That's nice. We haven't had a live chat question in a while. Maybe yeah, right. Look at us. Yes. yes. Crystal, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Hey, Crystal, how you doing? I'm good. How are you? Great to see you. Great to see you too, as always. Um, I have a very uh, technical question. Okay. I'm working on a, a, um, a couple of things. I was advice which I kind of was kind of thinking I was going to do anyway mm -hmm. um, to um, make one of my plays the Zeph and Violet the one about the Jewish um, mm -hmm. uh, into a, a film oh great to adapt it um, but I've never adapted any of my plays into a film so I don't really know like I mean I've I've written a couple of screenplays but a very very long time ago like like maybe like I don't even know how long like a full length screenplay, um, and so I I'm I'm not sure because I know with the and and with this play it's three it's like it's three parts it's told in three parts so I'm trying to understand like how the the structure of the three act three yeah three act um, f um, structure would work um, with yeah adapting it from play to the screen um mm -hmm. in an effective way when it's a three-part mm -hmm. play mm -hmm. um or do i just say forget it and just you know what i mean yeah yeah well i think i think it's always nice when you can build on um what you've already worked on you know that's yeah. always that's always nice so it, what's lucky is that you're sort of what do you call it? classic Hollywood style movie, right? Commercial movie is in a three act structure. Mm -hmm. So that's good, right? So you, you see you have a three act play and movies are in a three act. I mean, you know, your commercial movies are in a, oftentimes 
broken down to a three act structure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just to be quick, what you could do is go and get one of those screenwriting books. And I'm sure you have, we, we probably have them already. Take another look at it and just look at it in terms of what the structure is and see if that resonates at all with your play. You know, that could be super helpful. Um, I would say really work on building what you've already made rather than just throwing it out and starting all over. You know, um, you might find a lot of things that really work still, you know, um, you might want to keep it like almost exactly like it is, or you might want to, as they say, open it up. Yeah, I kind of was leaning towards that in the sense that like it was very, you know, remember it's it's in one room, it's two people and it's, right, you right. know, uh, present, past, present. And uh -huh. um, and I, I, I'm very um, uh, attached to the story. It, it's very, so I, I, I feel a little bit stubborn about changing it too much because I've spent so many years on it that I, I wanted to kind of see if I could keep it. I just didn't know how to um, just, you know, how to, if it would read differently, if I were to take it as is and just put it on screen. Well, uh, it, it probably would need some kind of, again, I mean, if it's in one room, you might, like you said, one, if you want to open it up, it's going to have to, you know, do they ever go to the park or go to the side of the river? What, whatever, you know, do they mm -hmm. ever go outside since, you know, that's a, a basic way to start opening it up. Mm -hmm. But definitely take it. I mean, the best, your best bet is to take a look at one of those screenwriting books. I'm not mm -hmm. like, you know, and just look at that three act structure. Cause if you already have a three act structure, it's a great way to start. Okay. Even if it's past, I mean, present, past, present, you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Even if that, you can still say, what ha in, a, in a classic screenplay, what happens in act one? You know what I mean? And just to, and to like, take a look at your first act and see, like, does that resonate at all? Okay. And then, and then think about what scenes would I like to see that aren't in that room? Mm. No? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Sure. Hi, Kimmy. You can unmute yourself. Hey, Kimmy. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hey. Um, I'm a little, uh, I don't know if embarrassed is a word, but, uh, you know, everybody has done this for so long. And this is part of the reason I wanted to go to school, because I just don't know the difference between things. When I when I write, I just keep writing. Um, so I don't know really the difference between scenes and acts and, um, you know, I, I've, I've read some submission things that one acts can be more than 10 pages or they can be 90 pages. And so I'm, I'm not, I get confused understanding what an act is exactly. And, and I'm, and I apologize if this is too pedestrian or too remedial a question. Um, but that's where I'm stuck. I, like I don't, I don't know the difference between those things, and you know, each scene and an act, and I guess structure is what I struggle with. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I, I, to me, I mean, one could learn structure in a program, you know, but you can also, uh, I think, uh, another another great way to learn about structure is by, I mean, we could go to things like go to plays, but even if you're, you know, mindful of your time, uh, you can just read a lot of plays. So reading a lot of plays, reading or reading a lot of, or looking at a lot of movies or or, or, or getting uh, screenplay scripts from the library, things like that, um, or, or buying them off, you know, the web and you read them um, is a great way to learn about structure. And, and and I mean, and that you can probably find a better definition of act, you know, than I'm going to give you. But I always think of units of action. So something's happening and they start out wanting something and they, they come to a some point of resolution. And French scenes are when people come in and out. 
why they're named French stains. I think they were invented in France. I'm not sure. <laughs> but it, but it, but you know but anyway so that those are units of action you know so and just like it, it, it's do you play do you play music at all no. not very well but i've tried but, you know so, you know what a, a song right of course a song and then comes the chorus right so it's like a verse doesn't have to be a certain length it just leads up to that moment when the chorus comes oh we're in the chorus you know what i'm saying it's that kind of feeling you want to have the same kind of feeling with uh, any kind of writing whether it's a chapter of a novel or a a monologue in a play it, it go it has that feeling it, you, it should get it should have a certain rhythm or an act you know, the characters are going for something and then they get to a certain place um, along their journey and we stop the action. So it's it's about it's about rhythm and again, desire. What are they going for? You know, and the best way to learn it, I really think, is you, you could I could talk to you about it all day long, but that's not nearly going to be as good as picking up a play that you like or a novel that you love, or a song that you love, and listening to it and going, so what are they doing here? You know, okay. how are they making it? You know, that's, that's, um, I learn a lot, still learn a lot at present tense from reading works, listening to music. I do read a lot of plays. I've seen a lot of plays. I, when I first started writing, um, suicidal tendencies i couldn't stop writing by hand i got about 57 pages and i sent it to a friend and and i said you know is this anything and um, i need help with structure she goes the structure's already there and i was kind of surprised that she said that and i don't know maybe from watching soap operas the young and the restless is a great <laughs> is a great <laughs> teacher of stage business and you know uh repetition and exposition and moving moving the story along so i watched the young and the restless a lot to understand those machinations um but i just I, I don't know i guess it was just lack of faith in myself that i didn't think that i was doing it correctly if that makes any sense yeah and and that is something that really you know no program can give you either that's something that, again, like we were talking to Grace, you got to start patting yourself on the back. Good job. I'm doing it. If your friend, you hand it, you write X number of pages and you hand it to a friend and they say, wow, Kimmy, you're really doing great. You know, hey, come on. You can give yourself some praise too. Um, your because ears must buzz all through the week because I constantly talk to you. <laughs> Thank you, SLP. Thank you, SLP. <laughs> or well, if, I, I, if I'm I, down I, on myself, I hear you kind of. No, no, no. Be, you might be served better by saying thank you, Kimmy, actually. Well, yeah, thank you for reminding me is what I'm saying. Like, because I'll I'll hear you say, no, you got to cheer yourself. And then I go, thank you. And then I change my thought process and then I do it again. But there you go. There you yeah. go. <laughs> go. It sounds I do good. appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you too, Kimmy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kimmy. Um, so Lori, we're gonna go to you next for your question. I just wanted to share SLP that the last man in Nebraska did respond and said, that makes sense. Thank you so much to what you shared. So Thank we you. got confirmation. All right, <laughs> last man. Thank you. I hope you know the last man. <laughs> People now over there, bro. I know, I know. Thinking about that. All right, Lori, feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi, SLP. Hi, everybody. Hi. I missed a, missed a few weeks and I'm happy to be back. So I feel all settled now that I'm back. Um, question about maybe uh, some things that recommendations that I might be able to read or just your thoughts on this kind of thing. I have dusted off a political satire that I've been working on and I sent it out to um, some people in a writing group that I've been in for many, many years. Uh, they're all playwrights and I value their uh, insights. And one of the women was just like, wow, you need to both get this out now. But also she's like, Laura, I just see this as a children's play. 
I've never written a children's play, but she's like, there's so many lessons in here. It's all got, it's about waterfowl. So it's got all these animals in it, huh. all these birds and waterfowl. Mm -hmm. And so first I'm wondering, you know, I've seen novels that have been turned into children's books, but I'm not sure I've ever seen, uh, uh, you know, a, a drama that's been then also made into a children's version of the play. And also, do you have any advice? Because I've never written a children's a play for children or young audiences. Right. Um, oof. I, I would just say, don't say words like, you know, fuck shit. God damn. Let's say like that. I don't think you're allowed to say those kinds of words in, in children's plays. Um, although children say those words, but we're not allowed to use that kind of language. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't. I, I If they say it's a children's play, I wouldn't, you know, what we think of the for a children's play, you got to dumb it down, you know, and simplify. I find um, children, I have a 12 year old, they're really sophisticated and they got a lot of ideas and a lot to say. And and um, they they um, they love great stories and, you know complicated things um so i i would say don't don't make it more complicated than it needs to be but also don't simplify it because you're going to be talking to younger audiences either but but if they say it's if your friend says it feels like a children's play maybe it already is you don't have to do anything to it Oh, Lori, you've muted again. So let me ask you to unmute again. There we yeah, go. there we go. Okay, I couldn't get it off on mute. Yeah, that's great. I will I will do that. Now. Yeah. I'll it's, make I sure I the waterfowl in it. That's really cool. Actually, that's the name of it, but it's the last four words are F O U L. Oh, <laughs> nice. So. Nice. That's really cool. But but I guess I'm going to have to scrub the, some of those words. Well, I, I mean, it, that's in my, you know, I, I, no, I, I think that they don't, you know. Yeah. No, I'm with you. Thanks. Yeah, I love that. That's great advice. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. It's almost six o'clock. Are we back? Are we back next week? We do not have a Watch Me Work next week, but we are back on July first. So this is our final Watch Me Work of June. Oh yay! Bye June. <laughs> Bye June. It was nice. It was nice. Nice. I hope someone won money on in their Tony pool. <laughs> it wasn't me, though. I I will say I celebrated a lot of the wins. There was some really like long time coming, well deserved wins yesterday, and that yeah, was nice. Yeah. To see. And not enough, not enough, not enough, never not enough. enough. But there were some. Yeah, but there were some. There were some beautiful. There were some beautiful wins. There were some beautiful wins, mm -hmm. and a lot of heart. I mean, everybody in that room is a hardworking person. Yeah. Uh, so that's what's that's what's always beautiful to know. Everybody in that room is a hardworking person. Yeah. And everybody yeah. in this room is a hardworking person. Oh my goodness. Oh I'm gonna cry. Yeah. No, it's it's um and uh there's a lot of joy in in hearing the call and answering the call yeah. and doing your thing. So let's keep that going. And we'll see you on the first of July. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you on July first. Okay, thank you. Thanks, New Work Development. Thanks, HowlRound. Mwah.